This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Five. Check for sound. Four. It's showtime. Three. Let's two, go. One. This is the Pro Audio Suite, a podcast for audio and voiceover professionals. Your hosts, Robert Marshall from Source Elements and Someone in Chicago. Darren Robbo Robertson from Voodoo Sound Sydney. From LA, George Whittam, the Tech to the VO stars. And myself, Andrew Peters, voice talent and home studio guy from Melbourne. Now, thanks to Rode Microphones, let's get on with the show. Welcome to another Pro Audio Suite. This week we have a special guest, the return of Jeff Silverman. What we're talking about today is a new song that's been released by Rick Springfield, a co-write between Rick and Vance DeGeneres. It's a real earworm. The song is called The Wall Will Fall, and I guarantee you'll be singing this for the rest of the day. Now, the interesting part about this song is there is a stereo mix which did actually chart very well on its first hour of release, but something new, something that Jeff has been playing with, which is 3D binaural. Now, basically, these are just purely headphone mixes of the same song. And just to give you an idea, here's a cut between the standard stereo and the binaural mix, the 3D mix for headphones. So what we advise you to do right now is to put your headphones on and check this out. No point in your resistance How can it be So hard to be free I'm gonna keep on Breaking into your heart Until you finally Give the key to me As the stars open to light the sky As the winds run to reach the sea We can no longer Turn a blinded eye Into our Wow, that's amazing. And that song went number one on iTunes. Is that right, Jeff? Right. It stayed uh, in the number one on the rock charts for two days. And I think uh, life is short up there on, on number one land, but it definitely hit it quickly. And I think the fan base is definitely locking into it. And all the videos that they did prior to the release was was just brilliant because part of this was a buildup to have Vance and Rick do a sort of, in in short, a beginning to end of what is involved to collaborate on a song with a blank piece of paper to a finished song with a lot of slapstick and tongue-in-cheek humor in between the 20-some-odd, or if not more, episodes that they did. Short, mind you, you know, maybe no more than a couple minutes to even shorter. But it really kept everybody feeling not so alone. But it really is wonderful to, to, to have seen the cause actually resonate with so many people now. Ellen DeGeneres played it on her show the other day, and I've taped it. I haven't seen it yet. So they're really out to uh, spread the message as much as they can to utilize his celebrity status for the better of humanity. And, uh, you know, I think that's wonderful. He's done that with the fires in Malibu. He does that with animals. He's a very big dog activist and animal activist. And you know, just I admire his ability to even in very difficult times to not think all about himself and what's in it for me and reach out and really try to help other people. And I've, I had 46 years of knowing him now to know and respect that it's not the first time and won't be the last. Yeah. If uh, anybody's interested, those videos I've watched, I think, probably all 26. Um, you can find them online. In fact, I have found them on uh, Vance DeGeneres' Facebook and plowed my way through. They started off being, you know, kind of humorous and ended up being completely bent. So if you feel like a bit of a laugh, <laughs> check it out. Rick goes right off the Richter scale as far as uh, bent humor is concerned. Um, uh, Vance so- is a straight guy. <laughs> well, he tries to be. I don't know whether it's actually working that well. <laughs> now, the other thing about the song is that uh, you've d- you've done a couple of versions. Obviously, the uh, standard stereo mix, which people would have heard if they've uh, either downloaded or bought the song. 
But uh, you've also been working on 3D binaural mixes for headphones. Um, didn't, comparison didn't everyone of, get it binaurally? The stereo mix went out first, and then just before that went out, Rick asked me, because he's been following my 3D binaurals for the last year, and some of them I've sent to you, Robert. Yeah, yeah. They've been improving. They've been getting better. Every time I do one, I'm finding new ground that I'm breaking, and especially with songs that are have a lot of space in them. And I was sort of feeling that that was my best environment to be able to convert a stereo mix to 3D binaural, uh, which is strictly headphone, mind you. And then Rick asked me to do this rock song, and I went, oh, uh, of course I'll do it. And I just took a little gulp and got all the tracks because I had to start from scratch. First of all, it's very difficult to take a mix that somebody else has done in Pro Tools with all their plugins. And and then I would tear it apart anyways, um, you know, because it's a whole rethink. At least that's the way I've been looking at it, just like I did when I was mixing 5.1 mixes. It, I looked at that as a separate mix, and I looked at my stereo mixes as a separate mix, and I didn't do any down mixing. So he asked me to do it, and I said, gladly, and it was a great experiment because I was dealing with so much saturation of sound that how do, how do I get separation? And then it kind of dawned on me that the Beatles used to do, you know, and all these old records where you'd hear the drums on one side and you'd hear the vocal on the other, or you'd hear some weird just stereo spreads that you would never think about. I thought, let me just try that. And so I first I had to get the stereo mix to sound as ballsy as their mix. You know, I just did my thing to it. I, you know, Maddie did a great job, uh, but I had my own particular approach to mixes and, and uh I got it to sound the way I wanted to, and then I went, okay, now I split it apart. And it was just a just a real treat uh, to try to get that saturation to really be clear enough that you're really feeling that dimension. But I, I, t- I just heard from the manager today, uh, Wayne Sharp, and uh, they're all go, and they want to get it out ASAP. It's new ground for them, and they're thinking in the future, too, that this could be great for Rick on some future projects that are coming up. And... Uh, other artists as well that have, are believers because it really has to take a little bit of faith in the fact that it's not established quite yet to say you're going to be a, getting a great return on your investment, but it does get you on the ground floor of something that we all believe is going to be taking off. And the reason being is that Amazon is leading the way with taking on this 3D binaural content as well as Dolby Atmos. And that, that's actually active right now on the Amazon HD platform. So, they're making it reality for us, and we're, we're, we're just ahead of the curve because there's not a lot of content there yet, which is a perfect place and time to get involved in this. So, But I did a lot of research on Dolby Atmos and what was up there on the sites with 3D binaural, but the main problem I see with Dolby Atmos is it can't be streamed in, in the headphones, and that's why Amazon has a box out right now that for $199 bucks that will stream it, but you have to do it through a television or a, a Wi-Fi television. But the only way that you can hear Adobe Atmos file is that it will render, sort of convert itself, sort of like a down mix to a 3D binaural mix in the headphones. So the tuners will see 7.1, which they're going to have to go out and buy along with all the speakers and have two up on the ceiling to to have a true 7.1 hardware scenario. And that's expensive right now. You can look on Amazon. It's between maybe $2,000 to $5,000 to get a decent and who knows what kind of quality some of these. These are off-brand things. Uh, and bars don't do it. The thing that you put up and they say it's 5.1 and they're spreading you know, sound waves up and they're bouncing them off the ceilings and the walls based on some sort of self-diagnosis that they have. That's wonderful, but that's not accurate in placement. And, you know, uh, Robert and I talked about this. Robert's done 5.1 mixes before. You know, when you have a direct connection to a mixing boards to a speaker... That's the ultimate in in direct connections. But the idea of the headphone scenario is very exciting to me because everybody and anybody can have a pair of headphones or earbuds and listen and experience the 3D binaural sound. It's not meant for speakers, but Robert, you played it on the speakers in your place. I don't know how you felt about it, but I'm trying to make a crossover where you can still enjoy it and both if it was played on the radio, somebody may go, oh, that's cool. They wouldn't hear any weird phasing or things lacking. It just is a different experience. And it will come out wider on the speakers uh, compared to a stereo mix. So what I did was I made Rick the 3D mix, and then I made him the comparison 
basically showing a little piece of the 3D, then it goes to stereo, then it goes to 3D and stereo and yada yada. And it, they were just blown away. And I was really happy about that because it was mission accomplished that I can actually do this with a really dense mix. If anybody's mixed in 3D, you sort of have the option to play something in the 3D space. And in fact, if the thing's using a head tracker, then that space moves as you move your head. But then there's another space that you can mix with or channels you can mix to, which are just straight left and right. They don't go through the environment. If you turn your head, they still stay left and right. And I was wondering if you, how you combine those and are you using those for your stereo compatibility to some degree? That's a good question. Well, first, I'm not using any head because there's not any VR gear that I'm relating to or right. associating with. So there's no with. head movement. There's no. there's no movement on yours, right? No, but it, I'm creating the movement just like we would if we made a 5.1 mix. I'd love to be able to have a video to do this with that had a lot of movement that I could associate it with. It would be no different than doing a lot of the you know music editing I did for many, many years, doing sound effects or whatever. Uh, but the idea that we talked about before was that these mixes are, are, are a hybrid too, because once I've mixed my stereo mixes, I like keeping some things that are in your face. Like, for example, one of the vocals that I did for uh, my wife's Blue Sun Rises, which I'd love to send everybody a link to a page that I put together that has these 3D example. She was the first 3D mix I did, too. After a while listening to it, I just decided it was better to keep her just like she was in the stereo mix and let the other 3D stuff around her spread around. And it made, actually, the, the mix even more dimensional. Uh, most people I try to keep kind of close, but there are things that I'm using that are are combinations of of things that would be right in your face to you know center speaker to or left and right, or I might keep them really close with no verb. The the fun thing about the uh, 3D stuff is the verb has some reflections have a, everything to do with where you're feeling the dimension. So it's it's just not static stuff. It's just some things that I want to move around or if I want to put into a certain place in the mix could be close in a sense of the proximity of the original signal, but the, the reflections are in the background sort of leading you to another place to create a bigger sense of space. Does that make sense? It does. And it sort of leads me to a question that I've got in my head because I've done a couple of 5.1 mixes, not a lot, but over the years I've done a few. And the first couple that I did, I found I fell into the trap of because the space was there, I felt like I had to fill it up. Like, is that something you found or, or, or is it more you've got to sort of plan where everything's going to be and go and just go with that? I think the most important thing I try to do, which would be no difference in a 5.1, is I try to get my bed feeling great without any movement and then make sure that I've got everything sort of statically in a sense where I don't lose the energy. I've heard some 5.1 mixes that are some some uh, Dolby Atmos mixes that are horrible, that they uh, they completely lose the energy of the original mix because they are starting from scratch and they don't morph the, all that energy that you had from that, that old 60s song or an Elton John song. Or That was my first goal was to get the energy from the stereo, then break apart into an environment and then start moving things around from that point. Um, I think your point of filling in spaces and getting too gimmicky is a challenge. I prefer liking the idea of somebody floating around your head, not all the time enough to make you want to get sick. Mm. But uh, I look at it like I talked to Robert. I said, uh, you know, it's like a roller coaster ride. It's like, you know, some people get sick, some people love it. So I try to kind of find somewhere in between that you can experience it and enjoy it, but not be over inundated with, uh, with movement to the point where it's just too much. That makes sense. Well, it does. Yeah, I, I have an idea for you, Jeff. How, how about yeah. instead of doing all your panning, you create a dance, and then people wear this with a head tracker and then they <laughs> movement by dancing around. Uh, if it sells records, I mean, I, I, I try anything at this point. There you go. <laughs> it's oh, the VR dance. I, I, I think it's a thing. <laughs> it's funny. You've always got to go that one step further. I do. <laughs> no, I think we all need something that's out of the box for the music business especially it's really taken a hard hit now with with so many people out of work with the pandemic and and no no hope in sight with the live thing until 
uh, people can get, not just the venues, but the people can get confident enough to go out. So my feeling was this is even more important to give people an experience that are sitting around. They need, they they just want to have something that they can, They first of all, have the attention span to listen because they're focused more on on their lives and their moment. And it's not distracted by 12,000 things and working an eight hour day that they are, they're wanting to hear more things that are possibly, this is the most opportune time to give them something new. And I don't know how it will take off, but I think with Rick's fan base alone, uh, he'll be able to explain it in a way that I think they'll resonate, they'll understand, and they'll buy it. And those sales and the proceeds are going to uh, Feed America organization. It's a nonprofit. So my goal is to see that happen as well uh, for this cause. And um, Is there any way to tie this in for the fan base to those who listened to him maybe in the early days of his career and maybe are a little bit familiar with quadraphonic sound. Yeah. What I'm really talking about is like uh, in terms of relating it to people that you're trying to explain bio, you know, binaural listening to people that just can't possibly fathom the concept. I'm wondering if there's a way to conceptually relate it to those folks or whether you even need to. It just it speaks for itself. They hear it. And they get a new experience. They don't have to understand why, right? It's just a new a new experience. It is like anything else, like we Robert and I talked about, even with source elements and the concept that we're doing right now, speaking in real time from all different parts of the country and the world. It's it's sort of an education that we have to give people in a in a very easy way to digest. And I, you know, the word headphone is is at the top of my list to continually promote. And if people are interested, that's why I make a stereo to 3D example, but that can't always be there with his promotion. I mean, it, it could be on his website, and which I'm going to recommend right. that they do. And From my experience, like when you listen to them back to back, it's like the, the, the binaural mix, it, it's kind of like putting on, you know, those uh, trippy kaleidoscope lens glasses. Uh-huh. And everything is freaking wild and cool and amazing. And when you take them off, everything goes back to normal again. And so it's that stark contrast that's kind of startling, right? I think if you hear it with out yeah. of context, without the without the stereo mix, but only hear the binaural mix, you you don't have that. I, I think it's almost better um, when you hear just the binaural mix because it gives you this. This is the way it should sound. Not right. that this is a new way it should sound, but this is the way it sounds. And there, that's, that might, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting experience. You're almost talking about educating the audience, George. Yes. I, I noticed the, the, the normal stereo mix had much more, had a lot more punch to it. And certain things where you could see where it might work out in certain situations, like um, playing it over more of a public address system or just a wider area of play where it's not going to be possible to really even get that sense of space. But in the, in the headphones, it was amazing how it made the stereo mix sound like it was being presented in a shoebox in comparison to the space that the binaural mix had. Like, like you said, things are like, they're not to your left. They're like behind your shoulder and to the left, they're way left (laughs) and way right. It's not meant to be a, a speaker environment, but again, I'm trying to make that transition uh, by how I'm incorporating things. So like we talked about, Robert, uh, there are certain elements that are still staying in the center. The most important things that you'll hear in the 3D is is the kick is still in the center, even though I have it completely off, the whole kit's off to the left on the verses and the intros. Then on the choruses, I bring the whole kit into the center where you have your bass, which is centered throughout the whole song, uh, the kick and uh, snare, and then vocal, I went to about 2.30 on the vocal with Rick. And then when Mark Richard Marks came in, I went to about 10.30 to the left. And I left Rick over there because it gave me, again, that, that ability to hear more things. You know how you have a stereo signal? You know, you think, okay, that's great. It sounds lovely, but it just doesn't cut through the mix. And the minute you just bring up one of the pans a little bit to one side, it's even in a stereo organization. mix. space organization. I mean, it's, it's making some space for it. Yeah. Yeah, but you hear things also with that, yeah. that, that mm. bit of panty. I'm not telling you anything you guys don't know, but I'm just to, for people who are listening that it's an incredible. Uh, it's it's a, it's the same thing almost when you have two things that are the same volume and you can't s- tell them apart. But then right. if you have two things and one is quieter than the other, 
you can hear the quieter one actually more clearly because it is quieter. Mm. And it's kind of a paradox, but it's true when you're mixing. You're probably probably bringing out the sound designer in me, but I, I can imagine like live recordings just coming to life with this. Is is if you yes would you, exactly in my mind you would just need what a couple of a couple of audience mics to make that work or are you better off like would you if you were going to do a three D mix would you prepare for it and have a few mics spread around the room in inverted commas would that work better do you think or or, or would you just get away with a couple of mics good question I mean I think that it's nice to prepare for as many room environments as you can distance wise. But when I did a mix with Rick doing a live concert for iHeart, and it was a big venue, it was huge. Uh, I can't remember the venue in LA, but it was. Uh, they had uh, probably five stereo stems, where were nothing but different mic placements in that huge arena. And I have heard some live 3Ds on Amazon HD already, and I think that there, there's a fine line between not being too stereo with it, still what's in front of you. Because when we were in a concert, there's, again, those reflections and things like that. And the direct signal that we're hearing is sort of blended in together and really important to not get too restricted to just everything up front and then hearing the echo in the back, which I hear a lot in, in film and television mixes when they do a surround. And I'm not impressed with that sort of scenario. I don't, I get a little bored. It, it's funny, the, the classical music world has dealt with this, and it's like, you know, do they present it like you're sitting at the concert and you get a lot of the reverb in the back of the hall and the orchestra is in front of you, and there's there's a strong thing going that way, but then there's also the idea of like really being right over the orchestra. And the argument is that, you know, for something purist like that, no one ever experiences the orchestra like that, so that's no way to present it. But um, when it comes to, you know, like music more of the you know studio type it's like any perspective works and even i think for a rock concert why not like i was thinking about that peter gabriel concert and the I forget how long ago he did it but it was like all in the in a circle and the whole stage is rotating well, was i've seen the, a 3d us? like that too yeah and it was it was beautifully done it was actually a camera right in the middle of a band a small band acoustic band so you really could feel as that camera was moving the, the idea of putting sound to picture, which it's, I'd love to do because I did that again with music editing for many years, about 15 years for film and television, uh, which it, music more as effects. And I was in the sound effects editor, but I sometimes the music becomes sound effects. And then being able to actually translate that to picture is, is a, the next thing I'd love to do, but we don't have that opportunity in a, uh, without having to buy extra gear. I think the idea here is to just keep it very simple and a nice experience for people to, I'm going to contradict myself because people are doing videos with these three Ds. I asked Rick if he wanted me to put it into his and, and I think we're just going to release it as a a straight audio, but for other people that you can see on my virtual studio networks.com, I'm sorry, selfless plug. Uh, But, (laughs) but there's a page on there where you see 3D binaural and you, you can, you can go down there and see the, three different 3D mixes, and then their stereo to 3D counterparts. And in those videos that they did, uh, we all did some movement in there for me to be able to do some uh, sound effects, like in the beginning of, of Deborah Lynn's video, Blue Sun Rises, there's an ocean and there are bells in the background, and I wanted to create the feeling of being in a, in a, in a countryside in Ireland, uh, looking out over the sea where you can hear a little bit of the sea in front of you and you feel the open air around you as well as the back and, and the city in the back with the chimes. And then at the end, there's a huge, uh, starts out with the, the ocean again and it gets more aggressive and more aggressive to the point that you're in a huge storm and it's thunder going all around you. And that was fun. And I in between, there were birds and things like that flying around that I was able to do some sound effects to picture in 3D scenario. Uh, with with Grant's Malloy Smith's Dust Bowl, which is about, it's a historical piece that was done about the 30s Dust Bowl here in America. He didn't have any bookends. And I said, well, why don't we do something that's sort of environmental, which I love the idea of doing because a lot of people that are there in 3D binaural land right now are acclimated to streams, meditation, things, you know, being sort of moody and, atmospheric or or environmental you know going around your head so we searched around for some great sound effects 
And then I was able to create the feeling of being a guy walking out the door and, and shutting it and literally going out into this complete desolate plains area that, uh, you know, people are just trying their best to stay alive. And then at the end, I actually have a dust bowl coming right at you from the left to, to completely surrounds you and then goes off to, the, off to the right after it hits you. And it was a lot of fun. Interestingly, I could see um, this being released like Rick's single, for instance. You could actually have two mixes, one called speakers and one called headphones. Well, I was thinking, doesn't the binaural format have, or, or not the binaural, but if you release it as proper VR, then I think you can control your channels of this straight stereo mix, not in the VR space and the VR space, I believe. But then you have to deliver it not as a you know left-right audio file in a fixed orientation, but a VR audio file that can then be used for you know head tracking and whatnot. But then you do have some options, I think. It's like an eight-channel file, right, Jeff? I'm not quite sure on that. I haven't even researched that at this point. But there are different ways of mixing a binaural from multiple channels. But I don't think that the headphones are going to pick that up if you're not doing it with head tracking. Well, um, it would be it would be with head tracking, the, those, um, those systems. But I think when you deliver the eight-channel mix, one of the channels, uh, I, th- I think it's eight-channel, like whatever ambisonics, like B format is, there's one that's like 16 channels or more. But one is like four channels or eight channels. And then you can put in or keep out the sort of stereo fixed mix, which on top of it lays the binaural mix that if you have a head tracker, it it keeps itself oriented to how your head moves around. I'll look forward to getting in further into that, especially if there's a reason we can have a visual to go along with it. But right now I seem to be able to get the placement just as easily, whether it be split out into four the stems, the way I'm mixing, I mean, I'm mixing in stems anyways through a, t- a, a multiple auxiliary sends. So each one of those has either a, a binaural plug in on the channels themselves if I need to, or down to each track of the drums to uh, subgroups of uh, things. Like, for example, there's tons of background vocals on uh, Rick's song. What I did was just basically just subgroup each part because there were three just basic parts. And there might have been a... I did some parts as well. I sang vocals in the verses, and I sang in the choruses as well with Rick. And uh, I was able to really do a, quite a huge span of background vocals with each part sort of designated in certain areas. There's no manual yet, and I kind of like that aspect. So there's a lot of experimenting that's done, and no mix is just created equal. So as long as I'm getting the effect in the phones, I feel great. I was going to ask you anyway, because this was uh, this song was a, a huge challenge, not just because you were working in this last mix of binaural, but the fact that everything was recorded remotely. So, you know, this is uh, our current world of being remote. Um, so every person, every musician that played on that song was playing from their little studio. Then you had to compile all the elements to build the song. What was the biggest challenge with that? They had actually done the mix and, and combining, although I did a lot of work on the individual elements that happened that, at that time, which were usually through those Vance DeGeneres Rick Springfield series that they did. But when I was working with those particular elements, I was dealing with really poor audio on their side because nobody was doing Source Connect, Source Elements, and which I was stressing, this would be much better, guys. <laughs> You'd be getting a, a much better signal coming back at you rather than hearing it through uh, Zoom or, you know, this the typical web camera s- distorted mono signal. But it still worked in the sense that they got the feeling that they weren't any more high tech than anybody else. Everybody can grab a phone and do this. But the problem was when a lot of these guys were really playing, you couldn't hear the music. All you could hear was them playing because they had the headphones on. So there was a lot of internal recording going on with each guy having their own system. And by the time they got that back, the audio was much better and could be replaced in the uh, actual uh, master recording. Maddie did a great job, uh, which is Rick's main guy that does sound for him, and uh, of coordinating all that into the multi-track. And then, uh, and then I was able to then get all those stems and then raw stems in the remix. So is Vocaline your friend? It was in this case. Uh, there were a couple <laughs> things that were my friend. Uh, and there's, a, there's a plugin called X-Tracks. 
it's not perfect science, but it was a, I was able to get in and do all kinds of editing to stereo tracks that needed some help. For example, if somebody's vocal was out of tune or something uh, in the guitars were out of tune. And it really gives you quite a, an amazing ability to control the actual vocal separated and the actual guitar separated, but not to use by themselves. It has to be the combination of, otherwise it'll sound horrible. But I was able to actually work with the vocals and work with the guitars and and then put it back together again and give it a little bit of oomph and compression. And that sort of like locked it all into making it sound even better. Uh, so so you had to, you had to extract or unbake the cake of the mix they gave you. You didn't have the yes. separate tracks. No, because I'm getting them from phones. Mm-hmm. So it, everybody was using an iPhone or something external. Even Richard Mark's vocal that's on there as well. Rick was in the studio when he did his vocal, which was great. Uh, for the final vocal, but not for the demo version, which, again, I was using elements of both in some scenarios to create different versions of these, which he's going to eventually release. But most everything that I got was nine times out of ten was not done in the studio uh, and done through a phone that I had to clean up in one way or another. So, So when they did it on the phone, what app did they use to listen and sing at the same time? Do you know? You know, that's a good question. I mean, each person had their own personal rig, and they probably had it set up to just do some basic monitoring, you know, with uh, their their own private system, and then they were just recording it on the phone at the same time, so they could they could use either audio. Does wow. that make? So, so Jeff, it it just seems like so much work, and there's like definitely better ways to do it. I mean, just file based. <laughs> You know, just exchanging files that start from zero. Um, it's it's interesting that there's this push to do everything on your phone or your iPad. We're starting to see that, and it's like, why why the race to like the worst device in the room? What what is it with people? Again, you're you probably experiencing that just with source elements and, and yeah. the things that you have to go through to tell people that this isn't like a normal scenario. I actually did a video with a, a guy that I did a 3D with, and we did a two-part episode to basically sort of subtly introduce the, the source elements connection and and then also, you know, talk a little bit more about his 3D mix. That was Grant Malloy Smith. And the first one we didn't mention at all about the stereo, and I'm going, you know, I'm just feeling that people aren't getting the fact that this is not like a, t- a normal Skype or Zoom connect. And I, I think there's still a, a, a lack of, awareness out there that that this can be done very simply with the uh, source elements plugins that that there's ability now to record people externally uh, you know in other places directly into my pro tools rig now and that's just amazing i mean it, that to me is uh, you you couldn't be doing anything better at the at the time where this world needs the most is to keep people actually communicating and working and keeping positive, just like Rick Springfield is. He's not letting this hold him back. And there are a lot of writers I'm working with and, and artists that are still maintaining their their faith about keep the music alive. It keeps their spirits alive, and but they have nowhere to record it. So as long as they can get their signal into their computer, I can actually record it for them and uh, they can hear a live stream without any delay. And that's just phenomenal, incredible. Hats off to you. Robert, I mean, you know more than I do what you do, but I, I have a feeling it's a lot more than just <laughs> than, than most people would realize. We, we've definitely had some musical uses of, of Source Connect. It obviously gets used in post production a, a lot, a, right. like a, a good bit more. But there, there should be a, a young new artist coming out with a song that was overdubbed all in uh, using Source Connect. Right. Um, and I think all the parts, like you know, were recorded. Up. We'll, we'll see where that one goes. And there's your project. And then I know that I had a chance to show you the remote overdub sync the other day. Yeah, and wonderful. I don't know what you're. Yeah, and, and you know, we pulled that one off over Source Connect. Now, really, it was amazing how stable the stream actually was for that time. It's probably because it was like two in the morning. Uh, or what? Well, I'm I'm running about 300 upload and download, so that that might help a little bit. But uh, it's still bottlenecks. Whoever I'm talking with or working with, but I've had really great luck of using Source Connect without any issues through Chrome with 90, 95% of all the clients have never complained about any of the, anything, let alone, they just feel like they can talk back in real time. And I've tried to express that as well, that the clients can be here on an iPad and see me and turn down the sound on their end and the mic and my and my end so we don't get any feedback. 
so they can see me, they can see the talent, uh, they can hear the talent, the talent, can, and then you were a genius in making this all, this routing thing happen because I had a specific setup I wanted to be able to utilize here and not just send somebody a stream. I wanted absolute communication between the talent and the clients and the artist slash and me. So where there's there's perfect communication. Well, well, we- we set up with that with both the low latency stream through Source Connect now, and then also the higher latency stream through Source Live, and then you could switch just with like I think it was right. a pedal or a or mute a plugin. I forget exactly. Yeah, what mute we ended a plugin. Up doing. Yeah, you've got yep. yeah the link. So so do you find that people need or like sometimes are in bandwidth situations where that higher latency stream is just better for music or for the absolute last process? I haven't had anybody ask for that, and I've given them that option, and they all go, I understand if there's a little bump in somewhere, or, and it seldom ever happens, and nobody's ever complained about it. No, I'm actually really shocked at the uh, stability of still going with Chrome. And I know that's not the perfect scenario for locking, and, and uh, there are better platforms that you can use, that, especially on the recording side. And basically, this, the, if I understand this right, correct me. Their parts are being recorded online through the Pro account, and I'm getting a sort of converted MP3 sound into my DAW, and then it's later then converted back to, to my system in full bandwidth with no dropouts at all, if there were any, by using Chrome. And then they, they can use a, a system that's not as expensive to basically coordinate with me and do their streams, which would be a slightly bit more reliable or, you know, as far as the streaming. Is that, did I say that right? Pretty much. I mean, it, it, the, when, when you're on pro and they're on standard, your pro copy can guarantee that it records everything perfect, perfectly. It's still the streamed audio. It's when you jump to pro to pro that you have the option to later switch it out automatically with the uncompressed. That's, that's the full, that's the end, end one. But the thing about Source Connect, honestly, is that it sounds pretty much like a straight wire anyways. The codec is so clean that, um, you know, you can do a lot of damage with that. And if you go more with your ears and less with the numbers, you'll probably be perfectly fine and it sound like a great record. What you're doing right now, I've com- I've done with music and I've brought it back into Pro Tools and I compared it to a uh, 1644 file. There was no drift at all. And it would be, I would be really hard-pressed to tell the difference if you said, cl- close your eyes and tell me which one this is. I couldn't hear any fidelity difference in the, once I locked up the the signals, I could go back and forth and do the same sort of AB I'm doing with the 3D in stereo. And I, I, I couldn't tell. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe there are other golden ears that would be a little more susceptible to it, but I, I think we haven't even discovered the full possibilities of 1644 yet, let alone all these other formats that are now considered ultra HD which is another thing that I'm very much into with the mix. I've actually mastered it for Apple Digital Music or iTunes because I want to hit anywhere we can to keep the profile up. Rick's scenario right now wasn't mastered for iTunes or mastered for Apple Digital Masters, and I just became an accredited studio. So also in the HD scenario, his his distribution company didn't get it on Ultra HD where I've got a I'm trying to coordinate with my connections now to get them involved with this guy who can actually get all this, what he calls superior audio quality, which is really 24-bit, 48K and up sound files that are streaming in real time and uh, or can be downloaded. And there's a huge audience he's, that he's telling me about that are, are audiophile people that don't want to listen to something on iTunes or Spotify because it's been converted by their specific formats and uh, MP3, and they want to they want to actually buy the actual uh, you know high bit. Is it, isn't that also what Title does? Isn't Title Tidal, Title goes only up to 1644, from my understanding. Uh, this is the new thing about HD is they're going Ultra HD, which is the 2448s, and there are other sites that are joining in on this whole concept to the point, according to the distributor that we're using, that the, everybody's going to be taking 2448 files pretty soon. I can agree that there is a bigger difference between 24-bit and 16-bit compared to 48 and 96. Um, I am surprised that they call Ultra HD 2448. I would think Ultra HD would at least be 2496. It can be, and it, you can supply whatever you want, but we were told that just give them the 2448 for now. They are going yeah. to go up to 192. 
basically. There you go. But you have to be you have to be native to it. You can't just take a twenty four forty eight file and say, "Oh, I'm just going to convert this to twenty four one ninety two and expect that they're going to play it." They have ways of detecting. I don't know how, but there there was some notation on somewhere that I read that they'll they'll bounce that back. So you, your whole session has to be bombarded by a huge amount of uh, horsepower uh, to actually do a full hundred track plus. Uh, Wait, they they would reject it if what if there yeah, was if a... it if it was converted from a lower bandwidth file. How would they know? I don't know, but I read it that they w- that's what they, I read. I don't know. Huh. I mean, I converted. I went. Well, this is easy. All you have to do is take a twenty four forty eight and export it out of Pro Tools as a twenty four ninety six or twenty four one ninety two. Lots of requirements. They should require a good mix. I think that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Jeff Silverman. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure. Um, The song is The Wall Will Fall from Rick Springfield, written by Rick and Vance DeGeneres. You can catch it online. You can buy it if you wish. Uh, We do hope you do because uh, all the proceeds go to help feed America. Uh, Jeff Silverman, thank you very much for joining us and hopefully no tornadoes, no storms and no more pandemics for 2020. Thank you. And I hope everybody stays safe and healthy during this uh the only thing I can say is it's a very challenging time. I've got to say, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's nothing self-isolation about being in the studio. I think we kind of, we got our A-plus on that one a long time yeah. ago. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I think only like a programmer might beat us as far as isolation goes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's exactly right. And on that note, let's have a listen to just another grab between the standard stereo and the binaural mix, the 3D mix for headphones of The Wall Will Fall. Take care of each other. This show was mixed by Voodoo Sound, edited by Andrew Peters, using Source Connect Now and Rode microphones, with technical support from George the Tech Whittem. Don't forget to subscribe and like us. You look for